And my name is Hugh Pross. I'm the chair of the program committee for the Museum of Healthcare, and I would like to welcome you all to our um, Margaret Angus Research Fellowship evening. And um, before we start, I would like to say a few words about Margaret Angus. <coughs> she grew up in the Midwest, the United States Midwest, and she got her BA in the University of Montana in history. And in 1937, she and her husband came to Kingston, where they both took up positions in the Department of English at Queens. And the, uh, at the time, and subsequently, obviously, they were extremely active in university life. The university was a lot smaller than the students that that um, she worked with and that knew her, got to know them both really very well and always spoke of both of them very fondly. They would go to her home, their home, for, for dinners and, and, um, and just um, really uh, enjoy having both Margaret and William Angus as their professors. One of the things that they were heavily involved in were dramatic productions, and for many of the productions, Margaret Angus actually made the costumes, some of which are still um, in existence and preserved. In 1947, the university formed the uh, drama department, and William Angus was named as the first head of uh, department for the drama department, and Margaret Angus was the second member of faculty in the department. Over the years, she was involved also with the CBC and worked for them on occasion. And around that time, the university was becoming concerned that CFRC, the university radio station, was not producing programming worthy of a university. So they had a committee to think about this, and Dr. Lower and some faculty and staff formed this committee and they advised the principal that CFRC should try to emulate the university, of the, not university, but should emulate Minnesota Public Radio's educational program and to try and elevate the standard of programming of CF CFRC. They also advised the principal that Margaret Angus should be the director of CFRC, and she held that position for many years. After her retirement, she was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws from the university in recognition of her, her work and her service to the university. That was in 1973. And in 1975, she received the um, John B. Sterling Montreal Medal, a medal which is given by the Montreal branch of the Alumni Association. Um, in a, to, given to what they called makers of queens for meritorious contributions to the honor of queens, which is how it's worded. <coughs> she was vigorously involved in the historical societies, both Kingston Historical Society and Ontario Historical Society, and she was president of both those organizations at different times. Many of you have probably read her books, The Old Stones of, of Kingston, and the history of the Kingston General Hospital. Margaret Angus was one of the original members of the Board of Directors of the Museum of Health Care, and in 1996, the Board established the Margaret Angus Summer Research Fellowship in her name with the objective of enhancing our appreciation of the history of health care and increasing our understanding of some of the artifacts of the museum that would relate to whatever the fellow was studying. Dr. Angus died in 2008 at the age of uh, 99. Sarah Zhao is our 14th Margaret Angus Summer Research Fellow. She obtained her Bachelor of Nursing Science in 2008, and from 2008 to 2010, she worked on her master's degree under the supervision of Professor Cynthia Baker. And she has been very active in university life on 
student committees, organizations. She has held several research and teaching assistantships in different mm -hmm. areas. And she's been an active volunteer in the university, at the Hotel Du and at Martha's Table, and worked very hard in the, in the university community. In August of 2008, she defended her master's thesis, the topic being <coughs> excuse me, psychosocial processes influencing weight management in persons <coughs> newly prescribed um, atypical antipsychotic medications. And you will see that her interest in psychiatry has served her well in carrying out her fellowship and we will hear about that now. The topic being torture or treatment electroconvulsive therapy. So, sure. Thank you, Dr. Frost, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for having me here today. So to start, I just wanted to show you guys all a quick video. All right, out with your gum. Huh? Out with your gum. Uh, yeah. It just won't hurt, and it'll be over in just a moment. Uh-huh. What's that? Conductant. A little dab will do you. All right, Mr. Jackson. Open your mouth. What's that? This will keep you from biting your tongue. Uh -oh. Now just bite down on oh. it. Oh. That's right. Just oh. bite down. Huh? Now bite down oh, on good. it. Good. Oh. Oh. Are you ready? Here we go. Now that was just a short clip of Jack Nicholson in all his glory. Um, in the movie, one flew over the cuckoo's nest and during an electroshock therapy uh, procedure. Basically, as a movie, it has stigmatized psychiatry and has cast a very negative light um, on psychiatry and psych psychiatric treatments. It also portrays a time in our history where psychiatry was thought to torture patients um, in very inhumane ways. So in tonight's talk, I will be introducing to you a brief history of psychiatry, talk about the electroconvulsive therapy and um, the machinery, the controversies, how it is used today, and provide some concluding thoughts on the topic. First, I will be giving um, a definition of electroconvulsive therapy. According to Dr. Max Fink, a renowned ECT practitioner and researcher in the field, electroconvulsive therapy should actually be traced to the definition of convulsive therapy, which is the use of controlled grand mal seizures or generalized seizures, usually at intervals of days to achieve a change in a psychotic patient's abnormal mental state. Other names that have been used to describe this procedure include shock therapy, electroshock, electrostimulation, seizure therapy, and electroseizure therapy. Now, dating as early as Hippocrates, psychological disorders were thought to be due to imbalances in the four uh, bodily fluids or humors. So you have your blood, phlegm, yellow bile, as well as black bile. So for example, it was thought that phlegm obstruction in the brain caused um, epilepsy and that black bile accumulation called, caused um, depression. These four humors were also associated with the Greeks' belief um, of the four different qualities, such as cold, moisture, heat, and dryness. And as a result, people were um, given, subjected to treatments involving these qualities depending on which bodily fluid was uh, in deficit. So common approaches included bloodletting and induced vomiting. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period, persons afflicted with mental disorders became a social responsibility. Persons who were deemed mentally disturbed 
were defined by their behavior such as hallucinations and illusions and were thought to be lost, led astray, um, possessed by demons, or punished for their sins. And so communities with the mentally ill were accountable for um, counteracting these disturbing or bizarre behaviors. And methods to cure these psychological disorders um, were related to persecutions and punishments such as exorcism, whipping, beating, and execution by hanging, such as the Salem witch trials. In essence, persons who uh, had mental illnesses during this period who were neglected by their communities were considered fortunate. By the 18th century, mental illnesses were starting to become recognized as sort of a condition, even if not a disease. In North America, treatment of the mentally ill became a family rather than a social responsibility. And as a result, um, patients who could not be cared for at home were often sent to jails and poorhouses, which were in very, very unbearable conditions. And these conditions were very unsanitary, lacked heat or food, um, were overcrowded, and did not provide treatments to these uh, people. And although the level of violence was lessened at this point in time, um, patients were still controlled and confined by the use of straitjackets as well as hydrotherapy, which you see in this picture on your right, um, where a patient would be submerged in a bathtub of water with um, a blanket sort of wrapped around them. They would not be able to um, escape. And it was thought that this was very calming and had a sedating effect. The 19th century marked the beginning of widespread social change towards treatment of the mentally ill with the introduction of asylums. Notably, Benjamin Rush, an American physician um, who advocated for social change and who actually wrote the first American psychiatric textbook, um, believed that mental illnesses were the result of poor blood circulation. And so he invented something called a spinning board and a restraining chair. If you see in the picture in the spinning board, um, it's actually called a spinning board or a spinning chair where the patient would be attached to the board or the chair and spun for hours until um, they were less psychotic. And this was because he believed, he believed that if you increase the blood circulation to your brain that they would be um, less mentally ill. And by the end of this 19th century, asylums were formed from jails to hospitals and the word Asylum was becoming discontinued and specialized hospitals were integrated for the mentally ill. By the 1900s, psychoanalysis as a treatment for psychological disorders emerged. Sigmund Freud, um, an Austrian neurologist, introduced theories regarding the unconscious mind and repression where mental illnesses were thought to be due to um, suppressed and unconscious thoughts. Freud therefore proposed the use of talk therapy as a treatment for persons afflicted with mental disorders to resolve these issues. By 1935-1936, surgical treatment or the removal of a portion of a brain, as in the lobotomies, became known as a possible method um, to the treatment of mental disorders. Iga Moni, a Portuguese neurologist, believed that impeding the cycle of morbid thoughts um, in the brains of people who had psychoses uh, would be beneficial. He also hypothesized that those who did not respond to conventional treatments such as uh, medication or um, talk therapy would be uh, quite suitable for, for lobotomy. The first report on 20 patients who received um, lobotomies revealed seven who were cured, seven who improved, and six who showed no change. And thereafter, lobotomies were actually quite widely practiced within, uh, during the 1930s and 1940s. However, the eventual public outcry with the fact that this irreversible procedure had actually turned some patients to become monotonous, um, zombies who lacked character, uh, led to the cessation of this um, treatment regimen. To begin my talk on the evolution of ECT, I'm just going to quickly define the term shock. Now, shock can refer to electrical, such as shock currents, medical, such as in surgical or hemorrhagic shock, or psychological, such as frightening or inducing fear. However, to shock or shock therapy has been deemed not to be a descriptive term to describe ECT and thus um, is not very commonly used. And with that said, I will begin talking about the evolution of ECT with Hellbore. 
The natural historian Pliny the Elder claimed that black hellebore, a herbal supplement, was used to treat mental illnesses as early as um, 1400 BC. This wild flower plant was a popular treatment amongst the Greeks to induce vomiting of a black bile in persons with melancholia. So if you can recall what I said about Hippocrates, the re rebalancing of bodily fluids. However, the principles behind hellebore were quite complicated. An overdose of hellebore was poisonous, and many practitioners debated on the timing of administration of this medication, of this herbal supplement, due to its rapid and very violent amidic effects. In addition, hellebore was documented by ancient writers to frequently induce seizures, which actually put psychotic symptoms in remission. Next, I will talk about the uses of electrical fish. The first use of electricity as a therapeutic treatment to alleviate physical symptoms, um, physical ailments of the human body was known during the age of Hippocrates. So electrical fish such as stingray, electric ray, um, electric eel, and catfish were widely used amongst the Greeks and Romans as cures for common maladies through ingestion or application on the affected area of the body. Now, the idea behind this was that it was believed that physicians Physicians believed that the touch of these electrical fish would blunt the acute feeling uh, of pain, was calming, and can even induce sleep. For example, Scribonius Largus, a physician to the Roman Emperor Claudius, had used these fish to treat the emperor's um, frequent headaches. So basically what he did was just put the fish um, on the emperor's head. Native Western African women over a century ago were also reported to put their sick children in holes where um, a lot of these electrical fish were found. Interestingly, however, ECT did not originate from the historical uses of electricity. Instead, electroconvulsive therapy should be considered as a technological advancement of shock therapy. In the 1700s, the psychological and physiological aspects of shock therapy were also used. Sudden shocks through the means of cold therapy or ice baths were prescribed as a form of treatment where the patients would be submerged in an ice bath. And the first documentation of this procedure was actually in 1707 where a Dutch carpenter had actually been cured of lunacy after falling into a canal. Um, of falling into a canal. And psychiatrists in this time also designed the bath of surprise, which if you look at this picture, um, it consists of a reservoir of cold water where patients would be suddenly plunged into while standing on top of a covert and deceptive door. The concept behind this bath of surprise was to shock the patient back to reality. And in case if you're wondering, this is actually a uh, advertisement back in the day for clopromazine, which is now um, an antipsychotic medication. Another German physician proposed the use of a surprise boat where a chaperone would actually row the boat with the patient in the boat and then unannounced would push the patient off the boat. And he would actually continue doing this until um, it achieved its desired effect. You would think that the patient would pick it up after the first time, right? Next, the interest in insulin ignited soon as after it was discovered in 1922 by Canadian physicians. Soon after the discovery of insulin, many experiments were conducted and insulin was found to have positive effects on mood. Insulin coma treatment was first introduced by Austrian psychiatrist and neurophysiologist Manfred Sakal in 1933. At this time, insulin injections were administered to patients with schizophrenia to induce um, a hypoglycemic coma. So when the brain is deprived of glucose, it actually, um, a stupor often results, which is also a condition known as insulin shock. However, Sakel eventually realized that these insulin co um, hypoglycemic comas often led to unwanted convulsions that were damaging to the brain, and hence this treatment was slowly phased out. Less than two years later, Hungarian neurologists Lazdislas Meduna documented the use of camphor-induced convulsions to treat persons with schizophrenia. Even as early as the 16th century, Swiss physician Paracelsus administered oral camphor to induce convulsions and to treat insanity. Now, camphor is actually a type of, um, it's a substance, substance with a very strong aromatic odor that is commonly found in the wood camphor laurel tree. 
So Medina's principles were based on the notion that schizophrenia and epilepsy were antagonistic in nature and that spontaneous seizures would actually temporarily or completely um, rid psychotic symptoms. And this technique is actually known as a um, term or a notion called biological antagonism where the induction of one illness, so epilepsy, could actually treat um, another illness, schizophrenia. Unfortunately, his experimentation reaped very unsuccessful results. Medina's use of intramuscular injections were deemed severely painful and distressing and achieved a very um, therapeutic response. In response, he switched the use of metrazole, a respiratory and circulatory um, stimulant. And in high doses, this medication can actually induce seizures. And so metrazole was a very effective medication in inciting seizures. However, like camphor, it also exhibited a varied response and surmountable um, side effects. In 1938, Italian neuropsychiatrist Ugo Cerletti and um, Lucio Bini first, in, first noted the use of electric currents to induce convulsions in the treatment of schizophrenia. Now, just a bit of some background on how this came about. In 1935, Hugo Cerletti, who conducted research on epilepsy, began to hypothesize the therapeutic use of electricity to induce convulsions. After he was made aware that electrical shocks were being applied to pigs at a Rome, uh, Rome slaughterhouse. His research demonstrated, however, that these pigs were not only conscious, but that they were capable of enduring very high dosages of electricity for a very long period of time. And in May of 1937, a basic ECT machine was put together by Lucio Vini in Rome. Now, this first picture is the original shock therapy apparatus that was used in 1938, which is now at the History of Medicine Museum in Rome, and this is also the one that Lucio Vini put together as well. Here's a close-up of the electrodes, which were also used in the first electroshock um, treatment back in 1938, also available at that museum. This is the room and bed where the first electroshock therapy um, treatment was first administered. And here is a plaque commemorating um, the first electroshock treatment with Trilletti and Beanie's name on it. Now I'm just going to tell you a quick story about the first patient. So, he's a 39-year-old engineer who arrives to Rome from Milan, um, off, gets off the train, is incoherent, um, hallucinating, delusional, no identification, has no recollection of his family, could not verbalize anything of the sort, and he was picked up at the train station by uh, police officers who brought him to a psychiatric clinic. Now, after a few weeks, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and fell into the hands of um, Dr. Cialetti and Bini. And then, he received his first treatment on April 11, 1938. Here's Lucio Bini administering ECT to the first patient in the Rome University Psychiatric Clinic. The bottom right corner here is also the first um, electroshock machine that was ever developed. The first electric shock administered was 80 volts at one-tenth of a second, which led to a period of unconsciousness with no seizure. The second shock was delivered at 90 volts for one-tenth of a second and produced a petit mal, also known as an absence seizure. The patient woke up from the seizure in a minute and began to sing a well-known song. Then, right before the third shock was administered, the patient suddenly proclaimed in Italian, non una seconda, mortifera, meaning, not again, it will kill me. Beanie, albeit apprehensive, went ahead and perceived with the third shock. The third stimulus was in an increased shock from the previous ones at 110 volts for one half a second, which led to a generalized seizure. Here the attendant removes the electrodes immediately after inducing the seizure. And in this photograph, uh, Beanie is checking the mouth guard during the generalized seizure. As soon as the patient wakes up, Beanie asks, What has been happening to you? To which the man replied, I don't know, perhaps I have been asleep. And here's a picture of Beanie holding the hand of that first patient. 
This patient received a total of 11 successful and 3 unsuccessful treatments and two years later it was found that the patient had an occupation and led a normal life. Next I'm going to introduce you all some of the artifacts or ECT machines available at the museum. Some of the earliest ECT machines were developed by Offner Electronics Incorporated, an American-based company in the early 1940s. Offner Electronics was developed by 1938 by American engineer Frank Offner after he finished his, after he received his postdoctorate degree, based on a recollection by Dr. Edward L. Margits from the Allen Memorial Institute of Psychiatry and Department of Psychiatry at McGill University, a modified multiple shock technique was used with the Offner 733 ECT machine, which is um, a later but very similar model that is shown here. And I'm going to quote in the words of Dr. Margits on this modified shock technique. The method is as follows. The dials are set at 400 milliamperes and one second and the lights are balanced. The current is then passed through the brain and as soon as the mechanism clicks off, the procedure is immediately repeated four or five times by flicking the test switch, then the treatment switch, without resetting the lights and as rapidly as possible. In this way, the current passes five or six times during one prolonged convulsion. One of the safety features about this machine um, is that it has an interlock that prevents the discharge of electrical currents past a preset value without resetting the machine. By the 1950s, about a decade later, Lectra Laboratories Incorporated in New York introduced the next generation of ECT machines. Lectra Series 160 and 302, as seen here, consisted of measures to improve safety and control, durability, and simplify administration. The safety features of these ECT, these ECT machines include two separate switches for power generation a master and a power switch which enables the practitioner to turn the stimulating circuit off whilst keeping the apparatus on. In essence, the stimulating circuit is kept separate from the power source, therefore maximizing the safety of the patient. In addition, the start button also had to be held down during the entire procedure of the treatment. Releasing the start button would cause the procedure to come to a halt. Here is ac the actual information pamphlet, or flyer if you will, on the Series 160, which promises safety, complete electronic timer, full range visible, visible voltage control, um, simplified operation, and a sturdy construction. In essence, these machines provided more variability and control over the amount of current and voltage so that it can be tailored to the individual receiving the treatment while maximizing the safety features. By the 1980s, ECT machines became much more sophisticated and specialized. Ektron Limited, a company based in the United Kingdom, had developed five different series of ECT in its time. However, many of their machines, such as the Dual Pulse, as shown here, were limited by being underpowered, and so it rendered, basically, it was ineffective with patients who had higher seizure thresholds. This next machine, which is actually not part of the museum's collection, but that I really want to show you, is called the Spectrum 5000Q and was developed in 1985 by Mecta Corporation in the United States. And according to the Mecta's website, and I checked this yesterday, this is apparently their top selling device, and I'm going to tell you why. The ECT machine, this ECT machine, um, is the, was the first and only machine that consisted of an EEG or an electroencephalogram to measure the brain waves and brain simulation as well as an ECG um, or an electrocardiogram to monitor electric, electrical activity of the heart. Interestingly enough, although initially developed in 1985, this is still one of the most widely used machines today in the clinical setting. Now, shortly after the discovery of ECT, the 1940s marked the widespread use of ECT. However, complications resulted, um, and this included spinal fractures. But these complications were addressed by Dr. Abram Bennett's research in 1940 in South America, where he discovered the neuromuscular blocking agent um, of Carrere. Carrere, which is a rainforest plant, was then used as a muscle relaxant to supplement ECT. However, due to the poisonous nature of Carrere, deaths occur with this combination, which led to the switch to succinylcholine in 1953. Succinylcholine is actually a synthetic paralyzing agent 
then continued to become um, the adjunct medication to be used with ECT and was still being used um, in 1980s. Interestingly, succinylcholine is still being used today as the muscle relaxant during the ECT procedure. By the time when antipsychotics were developed in the mid-1950s, followed by antidepressants, the use of ECT began to decline. Specifically, the successes observed in tricyclic antidepressants and monoamine oxidase inhibitors in depressive disorders and lithium in mania, as well as a host of other pharmaceuticals, um, led to the decreased interest in ECT. Many facilities providing ECT closed as a result, and despite this, scientists still continue to perform clinical trials on ECT, but with um, fewer subjects. However, in the mid-1960s, the efficacy of um, antipsychotics and antidepressants were deemed limited, so a lot of patients were not tolerant or not responding to these medications, and thus ECT became widely used again. But at the same time, also marked the antipsychiatry movement. The reemergence of ECT was immensely opposed by the antipsychiatry movement in the 1960s, specifically the Church of Scientology and other civil liberty groups. The antipsychiatry ideology based on was based um, basically denied the existence of mental disorders and refuted the claims that were made by psychiatrists. Their arguments centered around the notion that society had become mentally ill and those who had mental disorders were severely victimized as a result. And from Dr. Jacqueline Duffin's History of, Medi History of Medicine text, I quote, patients are called survivors. Diagnosis is viewed with skepticism and all treatments, including psychotherapy, are seen as methods of control, while psychiatry itself has become the enemy, if not the disease. This public outcry eventually led to the American Psychiatric Association to respond by delegating a task force of two and a half years to research on all the concerns that were brought up because of this um, outcry and to actually come to a compromise. Basically, the anti-psychiatry movement prompted research on ECT, which was a shortcoming within the field of psychiatry that had not been addressed in previous years. And with that said, the psychiatric profession, would have, which had been concerned with primarily uh, pharmacotherapy, um, thus brought in their scope to include ECT. And subsequent clinical studies examining the differences between ECT and antidepressant medications reveal a greater efficacy in ECT. A notable example in the media that was spurred by the anti-psychiatry movement was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. This movie, as well as an older movie called Snake Pit, really highlighted and glamorized the idea that various procedures um, in the history of psychiatric medicine were to subdue and control the mentally ill. And going back to the clip that I just showed you at the beginning, it is actually a very, very, very incorrect depiction of what ECT is now. Yet, it still lingers in many people's minds when they hear the term ECT um, who had watched this movie back in the day. Nevertheless, ECT, among other treatments used in psychiatry, are still portrayed um, as torturous, assaultive, and a form of control over those with mental disorders. Some of the indications for ECT are mood disorders such as major depressive disorder and mania, thought disorders such as schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders, and other psychiatric disorders such as anxiety, eating disorders, and personality disorders. But the evidence supporting these other psychiatric disorders um, aren't as compelling as depression and schizophrenia, which is why ECT is more used, uh, widely used with these particular diagnoses. The side effects of ECT has been a topic that has been largely debated and discussed. The most common side effect, or the one that has caused for most concern, is memory loss, which can be temporary or permanent. Other common side effects include headaches and myalgia, or muscle pains, which usually subside a few hours after the treatment. Some patients and I guess anti-ECT groups will also argue that ECT causes brain damage, where some patients who have undergone the procedure will have difficulty acquiring new, new knowledge or um, learning new things because of the procedure. So they will say something like, oh, ECT fried my brain. However, psychiatrists um, or other med medical practitioners will in defense say that people with mental illnesses um, often already present with cognitive difficulties just by having a very severe mental disorder. Um, so it's very difficult to tease out whether or not if this was inherently um, from the patient or because of the procedure. 
And in order to really understand the process, I decided to embark on an observership to examine ECT. So what an observership is, is basically um, job shadowing. And what I did was I basically shadowed a doctor who administered um, ECT in Kingston. So I showed up bright and early um, at the Province Community Continuing, sorry, Providence Continuing Care Center, Mental Health Services, um, out on King Street, which was formerly known as uh, KPH, or Kingston Psychiatric Hospital. And that morning, I had the opportunity to see five different patients. The procedure was very controlled. There was a psychiatrist who administers the ECT, um, an anesthesiologist who administers the general short-acting uh, anesthetic and the muscle relaxant, and nurses were also present to um, apply the mouth guard, establish an IV line, um, and to hook the patient up to various monitors. The entire procedure for one patient um, was about four minutes, and during this time, um, the vital signs were monitored by the healthcare professionals as well as the monitors. And although I don't have a video to show you guys, I can you will just have to take my word for it that it does not look anything like the video that you saw um, at the beginning. In a brief literature review of in a brief literature review, patients' views on ECT have been inconsistent. A systematic review investigating patients' perspectives on ECT challenged the Royal College of Physicians' assertion that 80% of patients were satisfied with their ECT experience and that memory loss was not a significant drawback to the treatment. These researchers um, of the systematic review concluded that there was a varied response in patients' level of satisfaction in the studies that were uh, included for the review. Recent studies have also yielded similar um, inconclusive results. It appears that patient satisfaction depends on a variety of factors such as the severity of the patient's pre-existing condition before the ECT, a remission of depressive symptoms, and a lack of subsequent memory impairments. And as a result, it is very difficult to determine a general or overall patient perception of ECT as each experience is unique to the individual. Now, with that said, I'm going to show you a clip of a patient who I um, interviewed who received ECT over 20 years ago. Um, it, the interview is actually in Chinese, but there are subtitles, so no worries. I Kim. I'm 每個禮拜我都有去做兩日義工 Family 很恐怖 但沒有去看醫生,因為我不知道我自己患了抑鬱症 
you know. Mm. Uh, 分別用過以前那些舊藥那些很害怕很重的舊藥吃到我就很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害怕很害
So in conclusion, I just want to provide some key points and or some take-home messages from my lecture um, and talk here. ECT was discovered over 70 years ago, um, emphasis on the 70, and has undergone a substantial amount of development and change since then. From, from machinery to administration, a lot of research has been going and have gone um, into ECT, and this body of research continues to grow. ECT is a very controlled procedure. Um, many precautions in terms of machinery um, and monitoring by the healthcare professionals are put in place to ensure the safety of the patient. Unfortunately, many myths and misconceptions about ECT still exist, um, which is why it is still a very controversial topic to talk about. And with that said, it is also very fortunate that even in our day and age that mental illnesses are sometimes still not considered as real illnesses. And in my personal opinion, I believe that the only way that ECT um, can be widely accepted or um, understood appropriately and accurately is through education. Um, I'd like to take a few moments to thank some people who made this project possible. The Dr. Margaret Angus Research Fellowship, which has allowed me to embark on such an amazing research project um, and to appreciate the history of medicine. Um, my amazing supervisors, uh, Paul Robertson, the museum curator, there you are, um, and Dr. Jane Arrington, Dean of Arts and Science at uh, Royal Military College. Thank you both so much for your insightful expertise um, throughout this process and unfailing patience as I was finishing up with my thesis and writing it and all that kind of jazz. Um, all the staff at the Museum of Healthcare, specifically the Fellowship Selection Committee, who believed in me and believed um, that I was able to do this project and gave me this learning opportunity. Um, and Miss Kim Chan, my aunt, who so graciously allowed me to interview her and her experience with ECT. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Jacqueline Duffin from the History of Medicine, a guru in the history of, I mean, from the School of Medicine, a guru in the history of medicine for providing me direction when I started this project. Um, Dr. Stuart Lawson and Dr. Nick Delva for their advice on ECT and ECT research. Dr. Dana Edge from the School of Nursing, um, as well as Dr. Oirumi from the uh, Department of Psychiatry, who wrote my recommendation letters to <laughs> pursue this project, um, as well as the Queen's Bracken Library and the CAMH Library, which provided me with a substantial amount of resources to work with to make this project possible. And of course, thank you for such a wonderful audience, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Sarah, for a fascinating talk and a very professional presentation. I'm sure she would entertain some questions. Yes, uh, was there any a solid scientific foundation behind the invention of ECT in 1938? Um, solid evidence as in like research studies before they actually embarked on it? Yes. Um, no, it was more sort of like an idea that they came up with that um, they had witnessed, you know, the pigs in the slaughterhouse that these electrodes were being applied to these pigs and that they were able to uh, withstand these dosages of electricity without dying, basically was the basis for it. And it just dawned on Charletti that, oh, maybe, you know, I'm studying epilepsy with dogs and perhaps I could maybe use these electricity in humans, and that's when he tested it on that first patient. Mm. I'll let you choose. Um. The, the main side effect uh, of modern ECT seems to be memory loss. I don't think I heard from you uh, an estimate of the percentage of patients who are treated who actually do experience significant me uh, memory loss. Can you enlighten us on that? Um, I'm going to say no, <laughs> because I actually don't have a number for that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you speak to any patient who has considered ECT or any practitioner who practices ECT, they will say that the most disturbing <coughs> or most common side effect is memory loss, but um, I, I couldn't be able, and if anyone does practice ECT, could comment on that? 
Well, I last administered ECT many years ago in the 60s, uh, but it was thought at that time that, uh, of course, the CD <coughs> threshold in patients varies. So sometimes you get a surprising response in anticipation of the voltage you thought you were going to use. And there was kind of a general rule of thumb that if a person ended up having more seizures than you really planned on, that was associated with a greater degree of memory loss. There, was, uh, there were some interesting studies done here by James Inglis in the Department of Psychology. And I don't know if they were mentioned when you spoke with various people here, but mm -hmm. uh, the sort of laying down of memory is really something that goes on on both sides of your brain. Uh, but Jim Inglis uh, had the notion that maybe if you applied the electrodes uh, unilaterally uh, rather than bilaterally, there would be less memory deficit. I think he was encouraged by some of his uh, earlier studies, but I don't know how that stood the test of time. Uh, maybe I could ask you in terms of their current methodology, did they use bilateral uh, electrodes routinely or stimulants? Yes, bilateral. I think bifrontal is one of them as well. I'm not quite sure. But those, um, these placements, which has been heavily studied, um, has been found to be associated with less cognitive impairments afterwards in terms of memory loss. And also I just wanted to comment on the older uh, machines back in the past used a sine wave. And basically it's um, pretty much synonymous to what you get from like a socket, like an electrical socket. And more developed machines now are using a brief pulse wave, which is more synonymous to the actual potential <laughs> in a neuron, so how the electrical um, activity works or transmits or communicates from one brain cell to another. And the older machines with the um, alternating current or the sine wave basically was associated with the most side effects or memory loss as well. I'd like to uh, add one additional clinical note. I yeah. think this probably still the case that when you have a patient who's intensely suicidal, uh, you need to get on with ECT. Uh, I don't know if that's still approach that you. Um, although it's most commonly used within depression, the mnemonic for uh, patients suitable for ECT is cramp. So catatonia, um, resistant depression. Um, acutely suicidal, um, manic or mania, and psychotic depression. So those are the five. Thank you very much. For Thank this. you. Um, I certainly was around a lot of ECT in my youth, and uh, I'm horrified when I see the cuckoo's nest yet again because you know it's a, it doesn't really reflect what. I mean, there are problems with ECT. Nobody. But there are also benefits, and you see people that have not been a serial, and they're getting memory loss anyway. They're deteriorating by the minute, and you see it's the quickest way of bringing somebody back into this world. As it were. Um, but I think that there, it's good that you've done this at this point in time, because there are so many things that are going on now. I mean, there was a big psych out conference in Toronto with the anti-ECT lobby. And I mean, they were they manned the barricades to an extent. There's a lot of propaganda against it, and yet um, sometimes people do not respond to drugs. Mm -hmm. And they need to be quickly taken out of a very debilitating medical illness. Right. And um, I'm glad that Dr. Dinsdale mentioned um, Jenny Inglis, because I think that was really, there was, seemed to be something there with the unilateral Mm -hmm. stuff. But it's not very many people get ECT who might very well benefit from that. And what is a bit of memory loss compared with five years not responding to anything? Yeah. And that's one point that the psychiatrist brought up to me is um, because she was previ previously a nurse, um, mm -hmm. she has experience, you know, both sides, I guess, as a nurse as well as a physician. Um, she always um, informs the patient that you know, you have to consider how important are your memories to you, you know? There is a possibility that you may lose the memories that you have formed before you will, you know, not remember your family and such, but you need to weigh the risks and the benefits as to, you know, how much, you like, how much more do you value? Do you value, you know, getting better from mental illness or, like, your memories, basically? Fascinating to ask. Thank you. To what degree do you think 
uh, access to ETT, ECT is contingent upon being able to be admitted to hospital. I'm sorry? Well, you dis your, your work describes ECT as if it is a procedure performed in hospital. Right. Many patients uh, with depression probably have great difficulty in being referred to a psychiatrist who could treat them as an inpatient. Mm -hmm. So were you aware in your studies of any difficulties of patients actually getting into hospital to receive treatment? Um, not that I know of, but uh, if anyone can answer that. Well, a lot of uh, ECT is done as an outpatient procedure now where the patient goes for a day visit and isn't actually admitted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I've, the, the little clip you showed at the end kind of alluded to this, yeah. but um, I was just wondering if um, what kind of scientific explanations they have for this, so what, so why people think that it works. Um, and then the other one is if there are any sort of concrete statistics about how often it is effective. There are a lot, there are a lot of references to it, <coughs> yeah. you know, that it is effective, but there are no numbers associated with that. So what are its actual success rates, do you know? Okay, um, so to answer your first question, I think, and any of you guys can correct me on this, I think why it is so widely discussed and why it is debated so much is nobody really knows how ECT works, so it just does. And some people will argue and say that ECT somehow resets the brain. So as in, you know, when you're, when um, a heart is going to fibrillation and then you defibrillate it, all of a sudden it goes back to a normal, it go, sinks back to the normal rhythm. And so that's one explanation that people have said. It just sort of resets the brain um, or increases the neurotransmitters, somehow just sort of fix it. Um, and if anyone can add, please do. Um, to answer your second question, I have been already just asked by this by the Queen's Journal who did an interview with me. Um, I don't have specific concrete data in terms of the efficacy, but um, I have heard and read that it's, it's kind of equal on the same side. So there has been studies showing that there, there are brain changes, that you do see, quote unquote, brain changes that are indicative what people will call brain damage after the ECT treatment. With that said, there's also other treatments, I mean other studies that have been done supporting ECT that have shown very, very successful rates in using it, but I don't exactly have a number. And I think that that's almost playing with fire almost because there are a lot of people who have differing um, opinions on the topic, so yeah. Is ECG uh, indicated in pediatric populations? You only really see it, you get chances to see the adult one in a lot of your talks. Um, I've only read it in, yeah, I've only read it in like mostly um, adults and primarily um, elderly too. We are in an aging population right now and many of the times psychotic depression you do see in the elderly and it is more commonly prescribed to that population itself. Um, so yeah. Yeah, um, this, there's a quick comment and then a question. Um, you, I appreciate the uh, like a brief run through of medical history, and I, you know, putting everything into like five minutes flat is all the best. Um, I'm just wanted to like one issue I had with that, where you talked about hanging as punishment for mental illness and bringing up the Salem witch trials, um, and especially within the Anglo-American legal system, there was always this idea of non compus mentis. So you weren't hanged for punishment if you were insane or had any other things. Like there was a movement well before the Salem Witch Trials for that one. Um, and then my question is, you talked about the first man who received the electroshock therapy or electro ECT. Yeah. Um, and you taught, you had three unsuccessful treatments and then a number of successful treatments. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what determines a successful versus an unsuccessful treatment? Yeah, I also wondered about that too. Um, it seems as though I'm just going to assume that um, the 11 successful ones probably um, indicate that there was some sort of an improvement afterwards, and the three that were unsuccessful, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. Yep. I was just wondering, um, I read a, a while back, maybe about a year ago, about there's new talk about deep brain stimulation. It's kind of like a, kind of micro shock, a, a neurosurgical approach to. Refractory depression. 
Did any, did you come across any of that in your research about that maybe being a potential teacher replacement for ECT or? Um, I've heard of it being used in conjunction uh, with ECT, um, but it's still a very new field. It seems as though it just recently sort of, some people are trying to go away from ECT because it has so many negative connotations and are considering the deep brain stimulation. Last question. Has yeah. <coughs> the ECT tried to use to uh, help with any other kind of mental illness? Like you're really talking about severe depression. I'm sorry, has it ever helped in other? Or is there any research about trying to use it for other mental disorders? Yeah. Um, from what I, I mentioned um, in the PowerPoint, um, it has been used in other sort of other psychiatric disorders aside from schizophrenia or depression, such as personality disorders, um, uh, eating disorders, and such. But there, the evidence for that isn't as substantial. So I think that they're kind of moving it towards in trying to treat other um, mental illnesses as well. For dementia. Dementia. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very, very much again. Thank you.